Welcome to the unit on unit 10, section on unit 10. We're going to talk a little bit about a particular experiment, look at a simulation of that experiment, and kind of get an idea of how these subatomic particles go together. Uh, sections 3.4 and 3.5 cover this sort of thing, so it might be helpful if you looked at that uh, before you looked at this slideshow and tried to see what's going on here. We're going to take a look at these a uh, couple things here. One is uh, Rutherford's gold, gold foil experiment right here. And it really is what, that's what it is. He uses a piece of gold foil and he does some exploration. Now, keep in mind at this point in time, we have protons, we have electrons. We're trying to figure out how they go, to, go together to make an atom. One of the common views was it was a plum pudding model. They're all just kind of in a wad of electrons, protons, and neutrons, and that's how they existed. But when Rutherford came along, he kind of took an approach. He did an experiment to, to figure out what was going on. And then we're going to look at a scattering simulation. So Rutherford's experiment is called a scattering experiment because particles are going to be flying all over the place. And then we're going to look at a simulation of that and see if that helps you understand this at all. So in the early 1900s, uh, atoms we already know are not indivisible because we found electrons in the cathode ray tube. So that, that went out the window. So each one of the <coughs> elements, atoms of the elements, have these common particles in them, electrons at least, and uh, protons as well. Now, at this point, the electron is pretty well characterized. We knew its mass, we knew its electron charge, we knew all that sort of thing about it. But the question about this is you have these subatomic particles, how in the world do you arrange them in an atom? So Rutherford devised an experiment that put, shed some light on this particular arrangement of particles. Now, when I, in my understanding is he set this up to, int to introduce a couple of postdoctoral students to how this equipment worked. He wasn't really looking for this at the point in time, but the experiment turned out to be something that was quite, quite helpful overall. So, in his experiment, um, he had a couple co-workers set up the experiment below and use something called alpha particles. An alpha particle amounts to, as they're relatively massive, they're really a helium nucleus. They've got a couple protons, a couple neutrons in it, but they're pretty heavy. And he used those to bombard a piece of gold foil, just like the experiment sounds, a gold foil experiment. Here's a piece of gold foil down in along here. And here's a source of alpha particles coming out in here. And so these alpha particles are coming through here. Uh, coming through the piece of gold foil, and he's detecting them on this ring around the outside here, trying to figure out where these particles go. The idea is sort of like target practice. You're going to shoot this at the gold foil and see what happens to it. What he found out was most of them went straight through the foil uh, undeflected, okay? which is kind of what you might, might expect in there if it's mostly empty space, but some of the alpha particles rebounded nearly straight back. And so it was kind of a strange looking thing. If you think about the plum pudding model, the one where it's all evenly distributed, you might expect things to kind of go straight through and not have a problem. However, this thing about them rebounding, coming straight back is a bit of an issue. As a matter of fact, it's kind of like a big artillery shell hitting a piece of Kleenex and bouncing straight back. We wouldn't expect to see that. So what we're going to do is shift over and look at a simulation of Rutherford's scattering experiment. Let's do these simulations once in a while during the semester. They come from a place called FET, which is physics something something. I can't remember what the ET stands for. Uh, but they're interactive simulations, and you can pull these up on your own. I have the site in there. I'll put it in Blackboard as well if you want to go play with some of these. They do physics, chemistry, biology, <coughs> all sorts of different types of things. Uh, I put the website here for this particular simulation you can go to if you want to go to that at some point in time. Now, what we're going to do is we're looking at a couple questions related to what I want to do right now is switch the simulation, give you an idea of what it looks like, and see if it's going to help us out at all. So let me switch over to that right here. And I think you can still see this up in here. And in the simulation, this is the Rutherford scattering simulation. I'll make it big. And what you've got is you've got two different approaches. One is a plum pudding model like this, where you have electrons. Electrons are the little blue things. Electrons are the little blue things in there. And then protons are going to be the reddish type of thing, just kind of smeared all over the place inside of here. And the neutrons are just grayish types of things. They didn't really show them in here much at all. But this is a plum pudding model, just kind of thrown together, and you might imagine an atom looks like that. And so if a particle comes charging into there, there's really no preference for that particle about where it might go through. It'll just go blasting through. There's nothing there to keep it from coming away, going away. And so if I take this plum pudding model and I put some particles in it like this, so these particles coming up are alpha particles coming up like this. You know, so these guys are going straight through. There's not deflected very much at all. I can give them a lot of energy over here on the right-hand side, make them go really fast, or make them go really slow, and they just don't seem to change very much at all. 
Now, if you look at traces of them, let's we'll see what they do. There's the lines, you know, pretty straight lines all the way through. So, what you might expect if it's a plum pudding model is you're going to get this straight stuff <coughs> going all the way through. But if we come back and look at what Rutherford thought about, is when he saw the results and saw that many of those particles come straight back, his conclusion was that really it doesn't look like that at all. What it looks like is we have an atom, we have an uh, atom in here, have a nucleus inside of here, it has protons and neutrons inside of it, and most of what we have in there is going to be empty space. So if I take a look at at the approach here, and I take and I fire these guys up here, watch what happens to these particles. Let me turn the trace on so you can see that. These particles get bent, they get deflected. If one's coming straight in, close, let's see if one comes in here, comes straight up kind of close here, he bends around, and he starts heading back. And so this suggested that what we really look at in the atom is we have a nucleus that has most of the mass in it. The neutrons and protons have the masses. The electrons are not very massive at all. And that the, the nucleus is positively charged because these alpha particles are positively charged also. And they're really getting repelled as they come in. And you can change the number of protons and neutrons and all that sort of thing inside of your atom and see what happens with that. So it's kind of an interesting simulation to play with and kind of get a feel for that. This is what it looks like. If you really do it, you get these particles bouncing back, which suggests that when you look at that gold foil, it's mostly a nucleus, a bunch of nuclei, mostly empty space around the outside. So let's go back into the PowerPoint. I have a couple questions in the PowerPoint. If I can figure out how to get back to it, there it is. And those questions go something like this. Do the nuclei, that's a plural of nucleus, by the way, affect the paths of the alpha particles more or less when the alpha particles are at higher energies? So let's go back and look at the simulation for a minute. Right there. And so what I'll do is I'm going to take the energy all the way down here. I'll crank the energy alpha particles down here. And the question is, are the paths affected more or less when I have low energy, let's say? I forget what the question was, but that's close enough. So you see here, this is low energy. These guys, they're not even getting close. They get bent around. They don't have enough to do anything with. If I come to high energy, Let's go to middle energy. I go to middle energy, they go further. Go to high energy, what I see is they actually go blowing through there, and they're deflected still, but not deflected as much. So it looks to me like at lower energy, they're more adversely affected by the nucleus in there. Let's look at the next question. The next question says, okay, so uh, if I keep the number of protons, oh, uh, keep the number of neutrons fixed right here, at some number, an increased number of protons while keeping the alpha particle energy constant. As the number of protons increases, what can you say about the approach distance of the alpha particles of the nuclei? Does it go up, down, or remain the same? Think about it for a minute. Think about what you might expect to see. <coughs> so what we're going to do here is we'll, let's put the energy somewhere in the middle. It just seems like it's a good start out. Middle goes something like that. And I'm going to take my protons, and I'm going to take my pro number of protons, and I'm going to slide them down. So I'm going to decrease my number of protons in here. Okay. What do you notice about the pathways? Are they more or less affected? Would I have fewer protons than when I have more protons? What do you think about that? If I look at the last question, okay, and now I'm supposed to keep the protons fixed, and we increase the number of neutrons, keeping the alpha particles constant energy. As I increase the number of neutrons, what can you say about the approach distance of the alpha particles of the nucleus? And so we go back to the simulation again, and what we see is I'm going to take, and let me put him in the middling range here. Okay, so we're talking about the approach distance, how close they get. He gets about this close. Okay, they get about that close in here. Let's change my number of neutrons. And what do you see now? About the same, isn't it? They don't change very much at all. Let's go back to the proton question, be a little more careful with it. Here are my protons. If I decrease, have a small number of protons, my approach distance looks like that. Pretty close, isn't it? But if I have a high number of protons, my approach distance is significantly greater. Well, protons are positive, and so are these alpha particles. So they actually repel each other and go away from each other. So it's kind of well, fun might be too strong a word. It's kind of interesting to play with those sorts of things and get a, get a picture in your mind. Some of you are visual types of learners. You need to see it and kind of understand it. And that's the best thing I have to be able to show you. I don't have one of those set up in my garage, so it doesn't work out. And here's the answers to the questions from before. Uh, is number of protons changes. It should say it's bigger. Okay. 
Oh, here we're increasing protons, then they go farther away. And if I change the ne neutrons, they don't carry any charge. They don't have any electrical interaction at all with the whole thing. And so it's pretty much what we just talked about earlier. So the conclusions from Rutherford's experiment, these are important. Most of the atom is empty space. Most of the alpha part particles go straight through the foil. We saw a nucleus with some alpha particles around it. Think of that nucleus as sitting there and the next nucleus being like a football field away. All those particles in between those two nuclei are going to go straight through. We don't see too many going exactly straight through in the simulation. There are concentrated regions of positive charge with a high mass in the atom. Uh, some of the large positively charged alpha particles bounce nearly straight back. And so Rutherford proposed the nuclear theory, the one that we currently use, in which <coughs> we have a nucleus that contains the protons and neutrons, contains a positive charge, contains the mass of the atom inside of it. The electrons, they're another chapter. Okay, so that's a quick look at Rutherford's experiment. Here's what you bring out of it is our atoms of the elements are composed of a nucleus, that has protons and neutrons in it. The electrons are somewhere out there. The nuclei are very small and very far away from each other. And what we're going to see pretty soon is that the difference in different elements doesn't have to do with what kinds of particles they have. It has to do with how many of those particles they have.